Thank you for coming and welcome to my presentation called Our Oceans. Life on Earth depends on oceans. Life began in the oceans. Our oceans are central to human well-being. They make up 72% of our planet. They affect billions of people. It feeds billions of people, employs millions of people, and generates trillions of dollars in the world's economy. They affect the weather and temperature. We have only explored 5% of our oceans. The average depth of the ocean is two and a half miles. The average temperature of the ocean is 39 degrees and is 3% salt. Three and a half billion people depend on our oceans for their primary food source. One half of the world's population lives on the coasts. 90% of the trade between countries is carried by ship. 10% of the Earth's surface is covered in ice or frozen water. Oceans contain 20 million tons of gold. The oceans are blue because it is the color least absorbed in, uh, in seawater. The water came from voluminous mounds of steam released into our atmosphere from thousands of ancient volcanoes erupting billions of years ago. And our planet is the only one where water has existed in it in its full entirety. Now today, our, this presentation will be sponsored by quite a number of undersea and underwater clubs and organizations, like the Underwater Basket Weaving Club, the Women in White Club. These women run through all the ponds in the villages and try to vote early and often. And the Martial Arts Club, Kickboxing with Dolphins, the Running Club, Underwater, and the Mermaid Club, where they have wonderful tales to tell, and the Sumter Landing Bicycle Underwater Club. Today, we will discuss how oceans work, a brief intro about each ocean, and man-made oceanic problems. There are five oceans, the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Arctic, the Indian Ocean, and the Southern Ocean, or the Antarctic Ocean. They are further divided by the Earth's equator into North Atlantic, South Atlantic, North Pacific, South Pacific. The oceans absorb the sun's heat and then transfer it to the atmosphere and distribute it around the world via ever-moving ocean currents. This makes global weather patterns and acts like a global heater in the winter and an air conditioner in the summer. Currents store and keep heat. Ocean currents are caused by wind, tides, salinity, water temperature, and the Earth's rotation. There are two kinds of currents, surface currents and deep water currents. Surface currents make up 10% of all water in the oceans. These currents concern the upper 1,300 feet of water and are shown in the red and are mainly driven by the wind. Deep water currents, or thermal haline currents, are the other 90% of the oceans, and they're in the blue, and they are all water, they are all water below 1,300 feet and are generated by temperature and salinity. When several ocean currents are connected, they form gyres, which are massive circular patterns of flow. Due to the Coriolis effect in the northern hemisphere, these gyres run clockwise, and in the southern hemisphere, they run counterclockwise. Gyres are systems of huge circular ocean currents formed by wind patterns and the rotation of the planet. The upper ocean layers move faster than the lower layers. That is, speed is reduced as the layers of water increase. The colder, saltier water is denser than the warm water, so the difference in density in ocean waters makes the global conveyor belt of circulation. Now, warm surface currents, here in the red, carry less dense water from the equators to the poles, and colder, dense currents carry water from the poles to the equator. The circulation of warm and cold water acts like a submarine river and moves water throughout the oceans. This conveyor belt plays a key role in distributing heat energy, regulating weather, climate, and cycling, cycling vital nutrients and gases. The North Atlantic gyre consists of the Gulf Stream, the North Equatorial Current, the North Atlantic Current, and the Canary Current. The Gulf Stream really originates in the Gulf of Mexico and in the Caribbean area and runs northeast toward Europe, where it moderates Europe's temperature. It flows at a rate many times faster than all rivers, most rivers. 
colder deep water currents mix nutrient-rich water toward the surface while pushing warm, less dense water downwards where it continues to sink. Some other major currents are the California and Humboldt current right on the west coast, the Brazil current off the east coast of Brazil, the Labrador current in the north part of the Atlantic, the Greenland current toward the Arctic, uh, the monsoon Indian current right here, and the, and the uh, North Equatorial Current runs 9,000 miles from Panama to the Philippines. Ocean currents are vertical and horizontal amounts of both surface and deep waters. They move in a specific direction and they aid in Earth's weather patterns. As water pushes northward to the poles, it gets colder and saltier. Cold, saltier water is dense and sinks, and the warm surface water takes its place. Like a winding loop, the water moves from bottom to top as it carries nutrients that nourish microorganisms essential for larger life forms. It would take 1,000 years to make the full worldwide trip using these currents. So if you put a message in a bottle, don't expect it back for 1,000 years. These are the heat signatures of what we're talking about. Obviously warmer in the equator, obviously colder in the pole regions. And furthermore, oceans are divided up into zones, the top layer being the epipelagic zone up here. That's the top 650 feet. And phytoplankton use photosynthesis here. The sun's rays can support photosynthesis up to 650 feet. This is the warm layer of the ocean, and this is where fast-moving animals and most th fish thrive, plus small and sometimes transparent organs like jellyfish, and the basis for sea life at the bottom of the, sea, uh, the, the level is plankton and krill at the bottom of the food chain. Next is the twilight zone, right here, the mesopelagic zone, and this is, this is between 650 feet and about 3,000 feet of water where there's not enough light here for photosynthesis. 20% of the nutrients from the sunlight zone filters as a zone. From 3,000 to 12,000 feet is the midnight zone, or the bathypelagic zone, which is right here. And where there is no light. The temperature is near freezing and only 1% of all marine life lives down here. The next below that is the abyssopelagic region, shown here. And 90% of all the ocean is in this deep water or deep sea part in the abyss zone. The pressure here is 400 to 600 atmospheres down here. One atmosphere is 14.7 pounds. So at 600 atmospheres, that's 8,500 pounds PSI. Actually, you get one atmosphere for every 15 feet of water you descend. And flatfish live here. The next zone is the hadropelagic zone, way down here, and that is 20,000 feet or deeper, like in the Mariana Trench that we'll be talking about, where it is 1,000 times pressure. By contrast, Mount Everest is one mile shorter than the deepest point on Earth, the Mariana Trench. And what lives down there at 35,000 feet? These hatchet fish. And when they made dives down there, the they found a plastic bag and the dive this summer at 100 feet deeper than when they found this. There was an object here. This is a metal with writing on it this summer, which means there is junk in the bottom of the Mariana Trench that we will be getting to. This is 35,000 feet deep. Trenches, by the way, are areas of subduction where uh, plates go underneath the earth and then sublimate and change to become the magma as well as lava that we experience. These are some ocean topographic features like the continental shelf and slope, the volcanic and mountain chains, the abyss and abyssal plains, plus canyons and trenches over here. This whole part of this has been sponsored by the Florida Mortgage Association where half of all Florida mortgages are underwater. <laughs> Next, I'd like to talk about the Atlantic Ocean. We will discuss each ocean individually. This started when the supercontinent Pangaea broke apart around the Jurassic 
period back when the dinosaurs were living. It and is the saltiest. The North Atlantic cir circulates in a clockwise motion. The South Atlantic moves counterclockwise. Some Atlantic islands are Canary, Azores, Cape Verde Islands, and Greenland. It covers 20% of the Earth's surface and is six and a half times size the USA. It really connects every other ocean. Now when, hot, when winds blow the hot air over the summer, over the Sahara and they blow into the Atlantic. This goes westward into the Atlantic and then stimulates tropical depressions that can move more west due to the Canary and North Equatorial currents which can develop into hurricanes and depressions in the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. So that's how this starts out. Its width, uh, its width is its depth is 11,000 feet. Its width from Brazil to Sierra Leone is 1,770 miles. It has 24 seas, bays, and gulfs, and is 41 million square miles. The Atlantic is widening four inches every year from seafloor spreading, which is how Africa and South America split up tens of millions of years ago, when the ancient continent Pangaea was, was around, and the continents we know were then formed. The Atlantic Ridge, or underwater mountain chain, runs 10,000 miles really south from Scotland and is twice as wide as the Andes Mountains. It is the longest mountain chain in the solar system. The deepest point where I talked about trenches in the Atlantic is the Puerto Rico Trench. It's called the Milwaukee Deep. It is 28,000 feet deep. That is over five miles. And there are other famous trenches also besides the Puerto Rico Trench that we'll be talking about today, plus the ones in the Atlantic. The Roman Age Trench is 25,000 feet right in here, and the Laurentian Trench is 25,000 feet also. The Atlantic has pure oceanic islands made from ancient volcanoes like Iceland and the Azores. Volcanic islands like the Lesser and Greater Antilles, like the Bahamas, Puerto Rico. The continental islands like the British Isles and Falkland Islands in Greenland and Ireland. Now to combine everything that we've been talking about today instead of just a bunch of facts and figures, the X marks a spot in the North Atlantic where the Titanic sank, about 400 miles east of Labrador. It is sunk at 12,600 feet or two and a half miles below the ocean floor. The pressure on the Titanic is 400 atmospheres. It is broken up in two sections, a half mile apart from each other. And there are worms in the sand down there that eat, have eaten all the wood on the Titanic and any, even some of the bodies that did sink down there at that time, back in 1912. And the Titanic is slowly rusting away. And the Bermuda Triangle which is really in the North Atlantic, right around north of the Greater Antilles, is just a place of, of greater, of more stronger ocean currents, as well as stronger winds in major shipping lanes, and that's why problems happen there. There is no room for the continent of Atlantis, there never was, and all that is just silliness. Move on next. In contrast, we will cover the Pacific Ocean. It covers 63 million square miles. The average depth is 15,000 feet. That's almost three miles. It covers one third of all the planet's surface. It's larger than all the land areas combined and has half the water on Earth in it. Most of the world's volcanoes, over 400 of them, are in the Ring of Fire, which is on the edge of the Pacific Plate and where tectonic plates converge on the edge of it. It is 15 times larger than the USA. It has 25,000 islands, mainly south of the equator. It has continental islands, coral reefs, high islands, and lifted coral platforms. Now, North Pacific storms are called typhoons. Two weeks ago, Japan just had a super typhoon, the strongest in 60 years there. And these kind of typhoons release 200 times more than all the power stations on Earth. And here's some more information about them. South Pacific storms are called cyclones. 
And the furthest and most remote South Pacific Island is? <laughs> okay, now we'll talk about El Nino. Under normal condition, the Pacific water closest to the equator is warmed by the sun. The trade winds then push this warm water eastbound to westbound, excuse me, to Asia and the Australian side of the Pacific, where it condenses and rains. The eastern waters near the Americas then are cooler and we get cooler weather. However, during El Nino months in the winter down here, the trade winds weaken and the warm waters move away from the Asian side and move toward the Americas. And this then causes more rain in California and the South gets more rain like us. We just had an El Nino here in December, just, just last year. Here are the, the times when it did happen. And what happens is the South gets more rain, the central part of America and the northwest part of America have, have warmer, drier weather. However, the Asia and in Indonesia, they get droughts and then forest fires because they get less rain. Here's what this looks like from space in an El Nino condition. The warm waters move toward the Americas, and these are the conditions that we get here in North America. Same could be said here in this satellite. You can see the warmth of water. And this is when La Nina happens, or a cooling trend, or the reverse of this, with the reverse conditions. So again, this is what this looks like, and the weather patterns you get with El Nino and then La Nina. Moving on to the Arctic Ocean, it is the smallest and shallowest of all oceans. It is five and a half million square miles with depths ranging between 3,000 to 9,000 feet. The average depth is 3,400 feet, which is four times shallower than the Pacific. The average sea temperature is 28 degrees. It has the lowest salinity because there are no rivers really emptying into it. The only river it's fed is really the uh, the there's just one area that flows into it, and that's called the Bering Strait, I'm sorry, right here. And it has the lowest salinity because of that. This is an ocean covered by an ice layer on top. And it has three types of ice. Polar ice is six feet deep in the summer and 164 feet deep in the winter. The pack ice is, is on the edge, the polar ice. Fast ice is around the pack ice. And what happened, whenever we see those films, we see a uh, submarine popping up through an ice cap. We always see a dramatic thing coming right up at it. That's in the summertime when the ice is only six feet deep. And the Arctic Ocean is divided east and west by the Luminosa Bridge, which is right here, with the Amerasian Basin to the west and the Eurasian Basin to the east. By 2050, this ocean is expected to be ice-free, which will change the amount of sunlight not reflected back into space, making warmer worldwide conditions. With no ice, many countries can then ship products more effectively around the world, and there will be a greater exploration in the area for undersea oil and gas reserves by large multinational companies. Many countries are now jockeying for territorial rights in this region to secure lucrative future resources. This is why this summer, the Trump administration wanted to buy the island of Greenland from Denmark so they can have future resources and have a base there. Obviously, with no ice, the polar bears and seals will become extinct because they'll have no place to rest and no place to give birth. In the last 30 years, we have lost more than a million square miles of ice in this area, about one and a half times the size of Texas. The sea ice is declining at a rate of about 1% a year or 13% per decade. This is why this will collapse in about 25 years or less. Now, whenever we take a trip out to Europe, we cons every person on that airplane is responsible for, in a round trip, 2,000 pounds of carbon. That's how much is, is, is em emitted into the air. This carbon acts as a blanket and holds the warm air in. And so this melts, this, this 2,000 pounds per person then melts per person 
30 square feet of ice, which is what this table is over here. That's just 30, and I'm not clear as to what depth it melts, maybe less than an eighth of an inch, maybe 160, uh, maybe 164th of an inch or 128th of an inch, but that's what it does when we do this kind of activity, and yes, I'm guilty. So, the Arctic ice melts, it releases nutrients in organisms that promote growth of algae, which feeds zooplankton and serves as a food for life. The zooplankton is called phytoplankton. Obviously, the fish eat the phytoplankton, the birds and seals eat the fish, the polar bears and some whales eat the seals. Phytoplankton is down here, and it moves up through this kind of food chain. Actually, some whales eat phytoplankton and krill, and there are 17 species of whales in the Arctic, but only three live there, like the bowhead, the narwhal, and the beluga. Next, we'll talk about the Indian Ocean. It covers 14% of the, of the Earth and is 27 million square miles. It is the third largest ocean, and the average depth is 12,200 feet, almost two miles. Uh, more than two miles. It formed 36 million years ago. The North Indian Ocean is 72 degrees and the south part of it is 82 degrees. That's quite a difference between the Arctic Ocean, which is a 50 degree difference. Because of this, it is the warmest of all oceans and then has a limited ability to support marine life. It's too warm to, for phytoplankton to grow, which limits life. Also, this ocean has the lowest oxygen content because of the high evaporation rate. This ocean has 57 island groups and icebergs appear in the very southern part of it. It is divided east and west by the, by the, 90th, by the 90 east ridge, which is on the 90th meridian, which is right here. Some very deep trenches are the Demanchatina Trench, 26,000 feet and the South Sunda Trench, or the Java Trench, is 25,000 feet deep in here. And it also has a, a submerged continent in it called the Kerguelen Plateau, which is in the southern part of the Indian Ocean, and this is three times the size of Japan. So at one time there was, might have been another continent there. This ocean receives 4,000 miles of river runoff a year. The last ocean we'll talk about in detail is the Southern Ocean or Antarctic Ocean. It is eight million square miles or eight, mil eight times smaller than the Pacific. It formed when Antarctica and South America broke apart 30 million years ago and is 13,000 to 16,000 feet deep. And it is the best thermometer we have for our planet. The sea temperature is 28 degrees because there's salt in the water that makes it colder in winter, and this ocean surrounds the continent of Antarctica and is south of the 60th degree latitude, which is right here. Though most sailors think it's between around 50 degrees when the icebergs appear at around 50 degrees latitude. And it is uh, the fourth largest ocean. In the summer, there are four million square feet of ice and the winter, it rebuilds to 20, million, 20 million square miles of, of ice. In the winter, it's 4 million square miles. In the, in the summer, it's 4 million square miles. In the winter, it's 20 million square miles. The ACC, or the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, runs clockwise circling Antarctica and transports 135 times more water than all the world rivers transport. The winds in the area are exceptionally strong and take a toll on ship travelers. The ocean plus the continent of Antarctica holds 90% of the world's ice. Antarctica is really a desert and the coldest, windiest, and driest place on Earth. The Sahara Desert receives twice as much moisture as the Antarctica does. If all the ice in the Southern Ocean and Antarctica melted, the sea level would rise 200 feet and we really would be underwater. The ice is melting six times faster than in the 1980s. The Antarctic food chain is shown here and start with phytoplankton right here, which harness the sun's energy at the very top layer of the ocean to make living tissue from carbon dioxide dissolved in water. They eat algae and microscopic plants. 
then krill, about the size of your little finger or even smaller, eat the phytoplankton algae and algae that collect under the underside of massive, massive Antarctic sea ice, sea, sea ice sheets. These areas under the ice are yellow to light brown from the algae growth and the krill feed on them. 500 trillion krill are estimated in li living in the Southern Ocean, which is why whales come. However, the krill population has decreased by 80 to 90 percent due to warming. That is, the sea ice is melting earlier and freezing later, making algae just below the ice sheets much harder to find. This then disrupts the food chain because fish and whales eat the krill, the penguins eat the fish, the seals eat the penguins, and some whales eat the seals. So, the, uh, these are some animals that live in the Arctic Ocean, like a squid, kind of a fish here, and the Antarctic seals. Now we'll talk about dead zones. Dead zones are hypotrophic, hypoxic zones in the oceans of such low oxygen content, content that animal life suffocates. And what's going on here in these dead zones is the, there's algae being made, too much algae, it sinks to the bottom and then it decomposes and uses up all the oxygen so that's why fish can't live there. There are numerous dead zones in the world, there's hundreds of them actually, and the, most nat the, most, the biggest one and the ones naturally made is in the Black Sea. It's uh, 23,000 square miles, and it's just fed only by the Bosphorus Straits up here, so that's why this sea has this kind of hypoxic area. However, the one that we'll talk about today and explain how this works is the dead zone in the, dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. It's, it's the second largest in the world and just south of the Mississippi River Delta. This dead zone is 9,000 square miles, or about the size of New Jersey. Each spring, as farmers fertilize their land north of the Gulf of Mexico, up here, the rain washes the fertilizer off the land into streams and rivers. Nutrient pollution is piped into the Gulf as wastewater. This then stimulates an overgrowth of algae. This then stimulates an overgrowth of algae in the Gulf and sinks and decomposes in the water. This decomposition process consumes oxygen and thus depletes the oxygen needed to support marine life. Their decomposition gives rise to abundant bacterial growth that consumes much needed oxygen. So the fishermen have to go further out to get the fish. We lived in Pensacola and we know people that actually as scientists visited this area. Half the nitrogen and phosphorus that runs into the Gulf comes from corn and soybeans in the Midwest. In Iowa alone, these crops cover two-thirds of the state. So that's where the fertilizer and runoff comes from, is from the high amounts of agriculture. And this also, this is because they need to fertilize the land so much, the farmers do, because it stimulates growth and the, grow, the crops grow faster, they get them to market faster, and they're bigger. However, when this washes into rivers, it gets into the Gulf and creates a vicious cycle. Now, there are many dead zones, and this is what they look like. There's one where the Columbia River, in between Washington and Oregon, flows into the Pacific, and you can see one growing here. This is what it looks like from space. These are uh, aerial views of what these algae blooms look like. And when they decompose, they sink, and then they consume oxygen at the bottom of it, taking, that's why fish can't live there. There's an algae growth in the Yellow Sea near China. And this is what it looks like from space. There are 400 dead zones throughout the world, totaling 100,000 square miles of ocean water. Every year, 10 million tons of biomass either dies or moves through these zones. Now, there is a dead zone not too far from us, and scientists are just baffled by the fact that there's no life in it past 8.30 at night. <laughs> Perhaps you know about it. Okay, so there's other dead zones in the Mediterranean Sea and the Yellow Sea. Now we're going to get into some man-made problems. 
One of them is overfishing. In the last 55 years, we've managed to wipe out 90% of the ocean's top predators, like sharks, bluefin tuna, swordfish, marlin, and mackerel. After the top predators, we went after and exploited and overfished the next step down in the food chain. By 1989, 9 million metric tons of marine life was taken from the oceans per year, but the annual catch has now declined ever since. We have brought, bought herring, tie, excuse me, herring, cod, and sardines to the point of extinction. The bycatching or entrapment of unwanted dolphins, birds, and other fish using long nets are just discarded after a haul. We can see that many of the world's, 25% of the world's fishes have been uh, collapsed. Another third, which is hard to see, another third overexploited and exploited. These are some statistics from overfishing with whales and dolphins being killed every year. Millions of sharks are just killed for their fins to use them in soup. And these are fish caught illegally. Large ocean fish now exist to 10% their pre-industrial population. At this rate, by 2048, all fishing stocks in the world will collapse. That is at a point of 10% level for every marine species on the planet. And overfishing directly affects people and their economy, it affects countries, and it affects obviously ecosystems. As an example of this, anchovies were overfished in the early 70s off Peru, right here. And the anchovies then were ground up and put in cattle feed. This is to make cows get bigger faster. Cows normally don't eat protein, they just eat grass. So they used another soy, they used another protein instead of anchovies, which is soy, which was substituted in cattle feed. The soil was planted in cleared Brazilian rainforests, and the soy was fed to cattle to produce beef faster. So overfishing directly led to deforestation. That's what's going on in the Amazon basin right now is farming and cattle ranching. And there's another way to fish, it's called dynamite or blast fishing. They take dynamite, this stuns or kills the fish, the fish float up. Obviously what happens to the coral reefs are a disaster. For every one pound of shrimp caught, 10 pounds are thrown away. The United States throws over a million tons of extra fish and unwanted sea life away. The world throws away at least 40 million tons per year. And this uh, graphic ex explains it all. The fish stocks are depleted. Most of them are stressed out. And how to prevent overfishing? Some common sense solutions include controlling size of fishing fleets, protecting areas, and require catch limits, plus have hundreds of more fish farms. And this is sponsored by the Underwater Sports Club, where they have the Underwater Chess Club, the Undersea Tennis Club, the Underwater Hockey Club, and the Underwater Fight Club. And this fight club, by the way, is used to help determine who will get the parking space in front of Starbucks and Sumter Landing in the wintertime on Saturday mornings. Okay, so now we're talking about the oceans are really a carbon and heat dump. They trap 90% of all the heat from carbon emissions. The emissions don't cause heat, but they act as a blanket to keep the warm, uh, air in the, the, our atmosphere. The heat in the oceans will be around for hundreds of years. If all the heat in the oceans were taken in since 1955 and suddenly added to our atmosphere, the temperature would go up 60 degrees. The extra pooling in the atmosphere percolates into the ocean. That's why we keep breaking record temperatures. This is the latest one from NOAA. The last 20 years have been the hottest in recorded history and they keep getting hotter every single year. The top 10% of water, oh, I said that. Much of the Earth's extra energy is trapped in oceans as a result of greenhouse gas emissions and is 1,000 times as great as the amount of energy mankind uses. On land, there have been 30,000 heat records in the last 10 years with only 10,000 cold records made. In the near future, the current average high temperature will be the normal setting. And, just to change the subject a bit, there's also something called the blob. 
No, that's not a science fiction movie. It's actually um, an area just west of uh, North America where the temperature is four to five degrees warmer and there's one off the coast of Maine. They're just studying this right now and they're not sure what caused this, but I thought I'd bring this up because it did make the news. Now these are indicators of a warming world, which you can obviously read here, but the, the this since rainforests, which are a natural carbon sink, have been shrinking rapidly worldwide, and this contributes to warming. The carbon dioxide has limited places to be absorbed and then goes into our oceans where more, more this causes warming and increased acidity because CO2, carbon dioxide, is just slightly acidic. And what happens is when ocean acidity is up, there then this limits diversity and affects the species at the bottom of the food chain. Now, cold water absorbs more carbon dioxide than warm water. So we see these changes in the Arctic and Antarctic oceans. Ocean acidity levels are increasing 5% every decade because one-fourth of all carbon dioxide is absorbed into our oceans. That's 10 billion tons or 10 gigatons every year or 30 metric tons every day. We in the world put 40 billion tons of carbon into our air, decade after decade. Clearly, this is causing a problem. This CO2 increases acidity in our oceans, making a weak carbonic acid, which release hydrogen ions. These extra hydrogen ions take away the calcium carbonate necessary to make shells for crabs, clams, crustaceans, and other aquatic life. And this is a pteropod snail or a sea snail, which are really phytoplankton, very, very small, smaller than your fingernail, and are affected by the extra carbon dioxide. These minute snails are one-third smaller than 10 years ago and are often unhealthy with broken or thin shells. This trend is happening so fast with the extra acidity in our oceans that most sea creatures can't respond fast enough for these changes. Now, how they measure this is they use Argo floats and they put these floats into the Indian Ocean, the North Pacific, the South Pacific, the North Atlantic, and the South Atlantic. And they look like this. There are 3,600 automated sensors called Argo floats that are scattered across our oceans. They record temperature in the top 650 feet of water, the epipelagic zone, as these floats periodically, periodically dip into hundreds of feet of ocean water. Data is collected to measure results, and this is basically how this works. A warmer ocean makes more ocean water, has stronger waves, erodes coastlines, fuels stronger storms that last longer that we just saw this summer, hurts coral reefs, and stresses fisheries. If warming increases, the extra ice melt will affect the salinity in the oceans. The warmer, less dense, less dense water will take longer to sink, and the global, the global conveyor belt might stop or be disrupted. Just one-tenth of a degree Celsius bumps the sea level up by one-eighth of an inch. This results in costly flooding like in coastal cities like Miami or New York where tens of millions of dollars are spent every year to combat this scenario. Also there's coral reef bleaching. This is the Great Barrier Reef off Australia which is 1,400 miles long and can be seen from space is the largest living organism in the world. Coral reefs are now a victim of human activity. Warming, siltation, pollution, increased acidity makes coral reefs bleach out and die. We have lost one third the Great Barrier Reef off Australia. These reefs are a natural protective hideaway for hundreds of millions of fish, millions of fish worldwide and take centuries, not years, to rebuild. In the Florida Keys, we've lost the Elkhorn and Staghorn types of corals and they are pretty much decimated there in the in the in that area. Coral reefs occur in really only in one percent of our ocean yet support 25 percent of all marine species. We've lost 50 percent of all coral reefs in the last 30 years. There are scuba organizations trying to plant more of these reefs with thousands of small coral sprouts or seedlings. So raise your voice about this, not the sea level. This area is sponsored by the 
BP and Exxon where you get more spills and more thrills, as well as the underwater marriage club where making your vows causes no waves. So we need to take care of our oceans. And the last subject we'll talk about and what everybody wants to hear about is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And there are three areas of it, a western patch near Japan, a central patch in the middle of it, and an eastern garbage patch between California and Hawaii. And it's located in a conversion zone in the Pacific where the warm Pacific waters meet the colder Arctic waters. It's really in a gyre, as you can see. The trash is collected at the center of this gyre where it is calmer and the trash collects there. This is, of course, near Gilligan's Island and near the Professor and Marianne Islands. It is three times the size of France or twice as big as Texas. It is seven million tons in weight and contains over 25 billion plastic pieces. There is six times as much plastic as plankton. 80% of the trash is from land by sources that is filtered in from rivers and 20% is from ships and oil platforms. 79,000 tons of this garbage is, consists of fishing nets. It has two million bits of plastic per square mile it is spread over 600,000 square miles. And by a process called photodegradation, that is the sun's rays emit violet rays that degrade this, this pollution, this plastic, it disintegrates, well not disintegrates, it breaks up into smaller pieces emitted by the sun. This is what it looks like. And there are tire dumps in our ocean. And how long until it's gone? Okay. So, this plastic cup, this actually styrofoam cup, 50 years. Actually, these, um, and fishing line, let me tell you something about this in a little bit. Fishing line's about 450 years before it breaks down in the ocean. Why plastic straws, they take dozens and dozens of years. Cigarette butts, one of my favorite subjects to talk about, there are four and a half trillion cigarettes being made a year. Obviously, no one smokes the butt. Obviously, they're thrown away. They degrade in about one or five years. Remember, matter cannot be destroyed or created. When you put it in the ocean and it degrades, it's still there, but in a different kind of a form. It might be in very tiny pieces we can't see, or it might be reduced to chemicals, but in essence, it's still there. It doesn't ever just go away. Because we put something in the ocean, that doesn't mean we get rid of it. It degrades and it's forgotten about. For instance, um, this plastic bag will take uh, between 10 and 20 years to disintegrate. And we all think it's wonderful to put this plastic bag, which five trillion of them are made a year, into, into, our, into our landfills. This plastic bag then is put into your garbage, which then is encased in plastic and then as a plastic bag. It's taken out to your front door and put into a garbage truck where it's compacted. Then it's taken to a landfill where it's compacted more. And in a landfill, this plastic bag will disintegrate, start disintegrating between 500 and 700 years because there's no air in the landfill. In about 1,000 years, it might degrade. So that's what's going on with landfills. And these are the top 10 items collected on beaches, and I know because I collected them. Cigarette butts, people use them as, use beaches as giant ashtrays. Plastic bottles, plastic bottles, 35 billion plastic bottles, by the way, are made every year. That's how much are bought, 35 billion are bought every year in, in the world. And we have plastic bottle caps and wrappers and these are some of the statistics about plastic right now. Five trillion bags, that's over 160,000 a second. And the plastic bags that I told you about, the styrofoam is the same way. Actually, this degrades and it gets so small, it gets into the rain. And so there are particles in the rain, particles in the upper atmosphere of plastic, and it's in your lower intestine. The report card for the planet is a D for disaster because we are in slow motion raping our planet. And we, this is, comes from, we have met the enemy and he is us. 
And what's going on here, we have a love and hate affair with our, ocean, our oceans. We love them because they're so gorgeous to look at, but we think we can put anything in it and for it to just go away. So oceans become a matter of convenience and entitlement. And it's also a place of serenity and finality, which is why the East Indians used to put dead bodies in the Ganges rivers to float them into the Indian Ocean. And that's why we sprinkle ashes in the ocean. Oceans are really depressions in the ground filled with water. And there is a finite number of fish in them and a finite number of species in them. And the plastics degrade, as I talked about, and the toxins and chemicals. And Fiji, Fiji water, if you buy that, that is 7,430 miles from Orlando. Who in their right mind buys water from Fiji? All just to have a status symbol. This, a gallon of water is 10 pounds. Well, actually it's eight and a half pounds, but if you put packaging on it, it's 10 pounds. Who would take 10 pounds and travel 7,400 miles for that? That's one third around the planet. I wonder what would happen if Fiji water was made a different name, like Cambodia water, <laughs> Ethiopia water, Laos, Cambodia water, or uh, Yemen water. Who would buy that? They buy it for the, not only the prestige, because it sounds like it's from a, well, it is from a South Pacific island. Sperm whale washed up this year and this summer in the Mediterranean. It had 48 and a half pounds of plastic in its body. I have the article in front of me. Ghost netting, they think, uh, animals think this is uh, kind of like a jellyfish and they get caught into it. And this crate was made in 1977 and it's still pretty much intact found in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It obviously gets into the food chain, gets into the fish, which gets into the birds, it gets into other animals that eat everything else. However, the blueberry crab on South Pacific Islands have made homes of our trash. And this is the amount of straws made every day. Ten, hundreds of millions of straws are made every day. They're all just thrown away. There is clearly too much plastic going on, being made. This is an article I just found garbage clogs once clear rivers of in all places Bosnia. They found refrigerators and dead bodies in Bosnia in the rivers there. This man just made the news just last month. This man crossed the Pacific. He went from Los Angeles to Honolulu on a paddleboard and of course he saw pollution every day. So it's not in just these gyres that you see, it's everywhere. And it's not just at the top, it's also just underneath. They have a system to trying to get rid of this like a netting system, this will take at least six years, hundreds of millions of dollars, but can't go below a couple feet of, of water. It looks like this. Every minute a truckload of garbage is dumped into our ocean. Gets into the seabirds, they look like this. And of course the garbage patches are located in different parts. There's one, in the, we've talked about the three areas in the North Pacific. Actually, there's one in the Atlantic that nobody ever discusses. It runs from Cuba to Virginia, and it has 500,000 500, bits of plastic per square mile. So it is the Indian Ocean gyre, the South Atlantic, and the North Atlantic. These are all gyres that have pollution in them. These are the most polluted seas, uh, the Gulf, the mid-Atlantic, uh, the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean, and the Yellow Sea that we've been talking about. Now, if you're wondering right now whether this is just an intellectual pedantic exercise concerning liberal environmental views, you might be surprised. I have personally been involved in beach cleanups, picking up trash, and have attended the Hands Across the Beach events in Pensacola a large protest movement where I talked personally with our governor while walking on the beach. Plus, my children and I have worked for state-run environmental groups for years in Illinois, sampling streams and rivers to access their health. I also ride a bicycle 7,000 miles a year to make an environmental statement and have done so forever. So yes, I have a passion for clean, healthy ecosystems. And does it really take a 16-year-old girl to address the United Nations to say that we have a problem about this? Or does it take people to actually step up and invest their time and money into this? And instead of just talking about things which are most of these shows talk about, 
for pedantic exercises, I have over here uh, bags that you can take instead of plastic bags to go to the grocery store and use them instead of plastic bags. You can also use paper straws instead of plastic straws. You can make a slight difference. Now we've talked a lot about major problems found in our oceans like dead zones, overfishing, excessive warming, garbage patches, plus our oceans for thousands of years. We have used our oceans as a huge space to get rid of unwanted problems and have not talked about solutions. The main solution to these problems is really living, really having and leaving a smaller footprint wherever where you go. One can enjoy life and still lead a simpler life. Living large is not the answer. Rather, living within our means so that our grandchildren can enjoy this gorgeous world is paramount to a better environment. The old Ernest Hemingway mentality of taking, exploiting, conquering, and subduing the natural wonders of this world through testosterone has taken its toll. Gone are the days when anybody can just dump anything anywhere into the ocean or air without future consequences. And this also concerns our air quality. The particulates in the air concern respiratory problems. We all have had a cold where we can't breathe too well. And the particulates in the air affect people and, and cause hundreds of thousands of people worldwide to die because they live in areas like Beijing or Los Angeles where they can't breathe. And lastly, this whole presentation has been sponsored by the village's real estate underwater offices, where our motto is, we really move our tail fins for you, and it's 6% they better. And you can also reach them with, there's also an agent on duty, Bob Sponge Pants, you could reach them at 1-800-SHARK-BAIT, 1-800-SHELLING-OUT, if you need them, calling them on a shell. We've talked a lot about a lot of problems. Hopefully we can iron them out, and thank you, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you.